When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. I'd like to begin today's sermon by asking the question, what is the purpose of COVID-19? I know that might sound like a bit of a strange question, but what I'm just trying to ask more broadly speaking is, what is, it's the age-old question, what is the purpose of pain and suffering in our lives? COVID-19 is one specific example, and a, a terrible example, uh, of uh, just pain and suffering in our lives as a humanity and history. And it's that age-old question. Now, to put it a different way, how are you? How are you personally, specifically approaching COVID-19? What meaning do you find in COVID-19 and all its fallout? Now, for some of us, we are naturally optimistic. And you're already having just the, the positive attitude. We are going to rally together as a collective humanity. We are going to become innovative. We're going to develop our science. And we're going to overcome this. We're going to fight this. There's some of us. and I read an article this week, we're looking at COVID-19 more as a truth detector, so to speak, something that reveals the heart of humanity. Uh, Frank Snowden, a Yale professor, he wrote the book Epidemics and Society, and he was quoted this week in an article, and he wrote, and he thinks, I do believe that epidemic diseases show our reflection, meaning they're like a mirror. These are events that tell us much more about who we are in lots and lots of ways. So for some of us, this pandemic is kind of like a truth detector for who we really are as human beings. The virus, it reveals our hearts. And as an example, just even with the mandate to socially, physically distance, you see a whole gamut of responses. Some people are, who cares? Some people are, and we're seeing who listens, who thinks the rules don't apply to them, who thinks about their neighbor. Same for the governments. Even more so, who prioritizes scientific advice, who values people and workers, and who moves quickly enough and effectively enough. Or perhaps you're much simpler, and you're thinking of COVID-19, and it is an epic, historic annoyance to you, and what you just want is your simple life back, with your simple pleasures. And so your heart is perhaps saying in different words or similar words, curse you, 
COVID-19. He's just angry. He's angry about what's going on. Now, how about my atheist friends? If you're a hard atheist, then your true cards on the table have to be, this is just a natural occurrence of nature. This is just survival of the fittest going on. Now, could you actually publicly say that? Perhaps you are still an atheist, but you're a softer atheist. And when you look out on, out on the world and you see all the pain and suffering, the fallout of this pandemic, there is a soft spot in your heart still. And you are still broken by what you see happening. And then there's some of us, the way we are approaching this pain and suffering and trying to find meaning in it, in it is just a blame. To point the finger, it's this government's fault. It's this country's fault. It's this person's fault for not quarantining after their trip and so forth. Now, my point is this. We are all looking for meaning and explanation for our pain and suffering. And we need it. It's human nature to need to find meaning and, and explanations for our pain and suffering because, A, it, it helps us get through it. This is where Jesus and his gospel shine brightly. Jesus and his gospel provide hope for our pain and suffering and an explanation for our pain and suffering like no other person or belief system or just worldview in history. I want to show you a picture of Jesus' end game when it comes to pain and suffering. And in Revelation chapter 22, we see a picture of the new world. So just reading from Revelation 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. God is painting a picture of the new world, taking this old broken world with pandemics and diseases and viruses and strife, and God is going to completely recreate this universe, including our earth. And those who have faith in Christ are going to do life as God always meant to be in this new world. And that's what's being described here. Moving on then, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the street of life, the tree of life, excuse me, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for, and this is the part I want you to notice, they were for the healing of the nations. That's Jesus' endgame. Today's passage are three little mini pictures of Jesus healing. But the end game of even these three little pictures that we just heard read and we're going to unpack more, Jesus' endgame is the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and the servants will worship. So I hope that you will be able to join me, that you will want to pray from your heart with me by the end of the sermon, a prayer something like this. Lord, I look forward to your healing of the nations. I look forward to your healing of the nations. That's what today's history in Matthew is about. This isn't just some fable. But this is recorded history of Jesus' life and ministry. And we see these incidents, these three incidents of Jesus' healing ministry. And how timely it is to look at Jesus' healing ministry, especially in light of the global pandemic. So for the rest of the message, what I want to answer is the question, how does Jesus heal? How does Jesus heal? And I want to draw out seven characteristics of Jesus' healing ministry. And I hope that they will give you hope, even as we face what we're going through right now. So first, Jesus heals incarnationally. That big word, incarnationally, it basically means in the flesh. Jesus heals in the flesh. What do I mean by that? Well, as we pick up in the narrative, verse 1, Matthew records Jesus coming down from the mountain. When he came down from the mountain, great, great crowds followed him. Jesus has just finished his famous and all-important Christian manifesto of a sermon, and he went up the mountain first, delivered wonderful new ethics for his followers, and describing what life in the kingdom is meant to be like in his kingdom. 
And Matthew intentionally describes Jesus now descending the mountain again. Why? Why does he intentionally describe this? Matthew's making two profound theological statements here. First, Matthew's original audience would have had images of Moses, one of their forefathers, and through whom that God had given their old covenant and the law. Matthew's original audience would have had images of Moses coming down as well from the mountain. Here, Matthew's making a statement that Jesus is the greater Moses coming down with a better and final new law, a new covenant of grace, not like the old law, but a covenant of grace. And Matthew is reminding us metaphorically that Jesus has also come down from the mountain of God, so to speak. He left the heavens, passed through the heavens, and found himself descended on earth, humbled in human form, taking on all our weaknesses. And so here is this picture of Jesus meeting us where we're at, being in the flesh. Now let me try to put this into perspective. And especially in these times of pandemic, we can appreciate this photo that you see here. Just think of all the frontline workers. Even in Toronto this last week, the last number I heard was that there were 23 medical professionals, from doctors to nurses to whatever other workers in hospitals, who had been infected by transmission, by uh, the coronavirus. And so here are doctors and nurses who are willing to be, so to speak, incarnated. They are willing to go right to the bedside of these infected patients. And these doctors, though they are, they have protective layers and masks, and yet we need to appreciate that they're right there, being willing to be in person and putting themselves at risk to also contract the virus. They are to be thanked, never to be taken for granted. And then what I want you to catch here is that on a cosmic scale, this is exactly what Jesus has done. He has left his safe place, his glorious place in heaven, come down the mountain to be with us, to meet us in our weaknesses without any protective layers. And he's come to the front line humanity to fight the most dangerous virus that we know of. And it's not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. The Bible calls it sin. The spiritual virus of sin that keeps us separated from God and keeps us on a crash course for eternity under his wrath unless it's cured. So first I want you to notice that Jesus heals incarnation. Next, Jesus heals sovereignty. That word sovereign, it means absolute power. It means authority and to have rule over a domain. And we see this as Matthew carries on his narrative. And behold, a leper came to him. Jesus has come down, incarnated himself, met humanity where we're at. And now Matthew uses his familiar literary device. He loves using the word behold. And it's his way of underlining highlighting, putting an exclamation mark, bolding, italicizing, all caps, to get us to pay attention to what he's about to say. And what does he want us to notice? That a leper, someone with an infectious skin disease, came to Jesus. Now, to give you an idea of how lepers were treated, and there's a lot of ties and relatability to what's going on even with the pandemic right now, But let me show you from Leviticus chapter 13. God had instructions for those with this terrible skin disease. So I read, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And so if you were a leopard, you also had to put yourself in that physical, just uh, just a state of, of, of sadness, and despair, and Leviticus continues, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. And I wonder if there too, if it was to cover up whatever droplets might come out of the mouth, and maybe perhaps they thought, or without them even knowing, God was giving them instructions so that the virus could not spread, whatever was caused this leper's disease. 
He shall remain unclean as long he, as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Basically, in modern speak, God was prescribing social isolation for the leper here. But it wasn't just to isolate themselves in their home. They were pushed outside of the city. Now, just imagine that. Imagine in Toronto, if the way we were going to isolate people and deal with curbing or flattening this curve was not just to ask people to isolate in their homes, but we found some remote area and we pushed everyone with the disease out to that remote area. In fact, if you read earlier in Leviticus 13, there's an instruction that there's meant to be shut up seven days at a time in some room and check after each week to see if the condition had healed. Now, the laws would have been practiced during Jesus' time. And so what we need to catch here and appreciate is that the leper here, he made a bold move. He took a risk to come from outside of the city and to fight his way through the crowds, to come out of quarantine shouting, unclean, unclean, and forcing his way to Jesus. This was a bold, desperate, and audacious move of risk. The leper was risking more social trauma and even more ostracism. And yet there was something, there was something that was compelling him. What compelled the leper to risk this move? We get a clue to the answer in, as the sentence continues here. And behold, a leper came to him. Now, the English doesn't capture it well, but in the original Greek, the verb here, it has a layer of worship built into the word. And so we could paraphrase this. The leper came to him to worship. There was something in his heart that was welling up. Perhaps he had heard of this Jesus, and this Jesus that was being declared as the Messiah, being looked to as one to deliver, and he had a hope in his heart. If there's anyone who's going to be able to heal me, it's this Jesus. And so his heart is compelled, and he is full of conviction, and he is resolute. And he fights towards Jesus. And we see this whole picture and notion of worship all the more because Matthew records this leper that as he comes to him to worship, he falls before him. He kneels before Jesus and he literally said words of praise. And so Matthew records here that this leper was saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He was recognizing Jesus as sovereign. Sovereign over sickness, sovereign over disease, sovereign ultimately over death, sovereign over this universe. Those words, Lord, if you will, it's your choice. You have the absolute ability and authority to command that I can be clean. So he implores Jesus, imploring and just leaning into his sovereignty. Would you do this? Would you do this? Jesus heals sovereignty. So Jesus, as sovereign, he stretches out his hand, touches him. I love these words of sovereign power and authority. Jesus says, I will be So simple. It's so powerful. Such a fool. Such a Look what Jesus does here. Be. Be. Be, be clean. Jesus is giving this man a new identity, a new being. Jesus transforms him from someone who is socially and spiritually outcast. Now he has new status. He is clean. Now, consider this thought. How about for you and me? When, when we pray for our friends or ourselves, or we pray for friends ourselves to see Jesus in his beauty as we do. When we long for God's healing in people's lives, we would do well to appeal to the, the sovereignty of God. We would do well to trust God and his ultimate plan. Do you approach God that way? Do you pray that way? Just believing that God is sovereign and just to 
completely trust yourself to his sovereignty. But next, Matthew, I think, wants us to see that Jesus heals holistically. And you see this in verse 4, because Jesus now instructs the former leper, the clean man now, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof to them. Jesus instructed the former leper to do this because this was the law. This was the protocol. He was meant to go to the priest and show that all his skin infections were gone, that he had fresh skin like a baby, and he was healed, and he was meant to offer a gift of sacrifice, of gratitude towards God. Now what I want you to catch here is that Jesus, he simultaneously is healing this man physically, socially, and spiritually. And it was all wrapped up together, all one package. You and I, we often like to dichotomize between our body and our soul. But Jesus here, he's making a definitive statement that we are body and soul together. In fact, if you think of it, just kind of sequentially, the disease comes to the body first. This leper, he had a skin disease, and then that socially and spiritually separated him. It was something that happened physically that separated him socially and spiritually from his people. He was cast out, out of the city. And so just in agreement with modern science, modern science and medicine is catching on to this, that, that very much our bodies and souls are connected. Our, our mental health, our emotional health, sometimes can be affected by our biochemistry. And vice versa, when we have biochemistry that's off, it can affect the way we think and we feel. And why is it that way? It's because God has created us that way, and Jesus affirms as much here. So I want you to notice, when Jesus heals us, it's a holistic, a holistic healing. Now, I want you to see as well that Jesus heals inclusively. What do I mean by that? Jesus heals in such a way that he doesn't leave and want to leave anyone out. We see this in the next picture of healing. As we pick up in verse 5. Now, Jesus traveled on, he moved on, and he entered a city called Capernaum. And in Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him. Capernaum even before the Romans were there, it was a very multicultural city. The categories in Scripture are the Jewish people, God's original people, and the Gentiles, meaning everyone who else who isn't Jewish. And so this was a city where there are a lot of multicultural people, uh, but all the more, as Rome came in and took Israel captive uh, and, and, and uh, was ruling over Israel, there was a centurion, a Roman guard, now, this centurion, you have to understand, he was an enemy of the ethnic people of Jesus. This centurion not only was an enemy, but even socially and religiously was seen as unclean in the eyes of Jesus' ethnic people. So much so that the centurion knew himself that he was unworthy to be in the presence of Jesus, a holy rabbi. And yet, what do we see happen? Again, God's Spirit is compelling this centurion to approach Jesus. God's Spirit is doing something in his heart, compelling him to want to approach Jesus and to worship Jesus, to respect Jesus, his ultimate authority and sovereignty. So Jesus sees something in the centurion that is so beautiful and rare. True faith in Jesus. Let me try to put it into perspective. Let me put up this picture again that I've already shown you. One of the most sad, tense, and recurring COVID-19 headlines that I've been seeing is the fact that doctors in the places where there are overwhelmed hospital systems have to literally make the tense choice, the stressful, burdensome choice, literally choosing who lives and who dies. There are not enough ventilators and respirators to go around. And so they literally have to choose who lives and dies. Can you imagine that pressure? Can you imagine you having to decide who lives and who dies? And because you're forced with that decision, inevitably, at some point, you're going to have to discriminate 
and exclude. And yet, we see Jesus profoundly extending his life-giving grace without any discrimination. Jesus meeting the centurion is profound and mind-blowing, especially in the eyes of his own ethnic people. And for him to extend a life-giving grace to the centurion to see his faith and to meet his request to bring healing to his servant. This is what I mean by Jesus healing inclusively. His heart is so big and so wide. He wants his grace to go to everyone. Friend, is Christ calling you today? Do you sense in your heart, similar to the leper and the centurion, something in your heart that is drawing you to Christ? Drawing you to think more about, to want to know more about, to really figure out and to listen to what is Jesus' meaning to pain and suffering in this life? Is there life beyond this life? And I hope you'll pay attention to that, that yearning, and that stirring in your heart. But we also see that Jesus heals declaratively. I was thinking here, perhaps to say Jesus heals authoritatively or commandingly. But the point is here that Jesus, the way he heals is that he speaks. He speaks a word. A very simple word, and it happens. And so Jesus pronounces, he declares something, and it happens. And so we see the centurion understanding authority and recognizing this absolute, ultimate authority in Christ. In verse 8, he says to Jesus, but only say the word, declare the word, and my servant will be healed. The centurion goes on to explain that he understands the whole dynamic of authority, how it works. To say the word, Jesus. And this is why we see in verse 10 that Jesus marvels. Jesus marvels. He is admiring the centurion's heart. And really what Jesus is admiring and seeing is what the Spirit of God has been creating in the centurion. To believe, to approach Jesus in this acknowledging and affirming matter to, in his heart to bow low even though he's a mighty centurion to submit himself to Christ. Now, here's something for you and me to pause and reflect on. Friend, are you at a fork in the road? Meaning, at some point, whether you put your faith in Christ or not, what it really comes down to is whether you will take the words of Jesus seriously. There's a fork in the road. Either I will really listen to what Jesus has to say and realize that his words are true words and they have great weight for this life and the next life. Or I will just dispel Jesus' words. That's the fork in the road. And Jesus here, he pauses. And even as he's dealing with the centurion, he turns to everyone who's watching this transpire. He reminds them of just the gravity of being at that fork of the road. And Jesus himself had no bashfulness in talking about the stark realities of heaven and hell. And so Jesus himself here in verse 12, reminding people that there will be even many of his own ethnic people who will not place faith in him, and where they were meant to be the heirs of God's new world in eternity. Sadly, they will find themselves instead under God's wrath for eternity because they don't place their faith in him. That's why Jesus says, these sons of the kingdom, meaning of Israel, of Jesus' ethnic people, they'll be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so Jesus says to the centurion, Go, let it be done for you as you have. So here's a picture of what faith looks like. Jesus is literally saying, Go, let it be done for you as you have had faith in me. And so here Jesus, he sovereignly chooses to heal at this time. Now we need to pause here and be very careful not to misinterpret what's going on here. It's tempting to misinterpret, Go and let it be done for you as you believe, 
to think that God is a genie God, that if we just believe it, that we'll receive it, that if we name something, then we can claim something, and we can have whatever we want. But we know through history that there are many people that it hasn't worked out for them that way. Just to even think of Jesus' literal time on earth. For every one person that Jesus healed, there were thousands that never got to be in the presence of Jesus and experience the same healing. Now, that is not to say wherever Jesus was, he had a hundred percent healing batting average or a thousand. He was batting a thousand in terms of healing. But what Jesus was doing here, Jesus' presence in his healing ministry. It was a preview of what was to come. A preview of a new world where all pain and suffering, all diseases and ailments will be one day finally eradicated. And we'll all be healthy and have our eternal, unaging bodies once again. And so where Jesus chooses to heal sovereignly, here is the lighting to show a preview of what is to come. What you and I need to remember them. Because I know there are those of us who are hurting, physically hurting. But we look out on the world situation right now and our heart breaks for those who are suffering because of this virus. What we need to understand is that God, in his wisdom and his ways that are higher than ours, he will allow suffering and pain in our lives as much as it will keep us close to him. Put it this way, and I have to ask myself this question often, these two questions. Would you rather have a perfect life here on earth where you're healthy and everything is going just perfectly for you, only to find yourself forgetting about Christ because you're so self-sufficient and self-happy? Would you want that life? Would you rather have a temporary perfect life here on earth but spend eternity under the wrath of God. You see, sometimes pain and suffering, they have a, a beautiful, humbling effect on us. And they bring us back to God, to have faith in Christ. And if God can see it as a good father, that that will keep us close to him, because God would rather have us for eternity, living the life that he always meant, than have us suffer a little bit here on earth than for us to just be just comfortable and, and pleasured during this short life here to be apart from him for eternity. And finally, we need to see that Jesus heals eternally. Where do we see this? Matthew, to uh, end off this little section of Jesus' healing ministry, he says in verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Isaiah had insight into the end game. Isaiah, in other words, he saw that Jesus' end game was the healing of all the nations. And so Isaiah knew that Jesus' purpose was to come to this earth without any protective layers, to descend the mountain, to find himself humbled in human form, to meet us where we are, to take upon himself the spiritual virus of our sins and to even deal with our physical illnesses and diseases and ultimately dealing with the very root of where our sicknesses and diseases and illnesses come from, meaning sin. Diseases and illnesses were a fallout of sin and this world becoming accursed, our bodies becoming cursed and now breaking down and going back to dust now dying instead of living on forever as they were meant to. And so Isaiah is pointing to our great hope that Christ will heal the nations. Jesus had a healing ministry to demonstrate that through him, God's eternal kingdom, the new world that he will construct one day in eternity, it was breaking in. And Isaiah's point, and Matthew is agreeing with him because he's quoting Isaiah, is that Jesus has come as a living, walking preview of God's final new creation, new world after this life. Look, I want you to understand that illnesses and diseases, this pandemic, is evidence 
that we are still separated from God. That this earth is still under the curse. Let me try to make a comparison and just land the plane this way. This past week, one of my friends, they were one of those trying to get back to Canada from abroad. When they finally reached customs in Canada, they were able to get back in because A, they weren't sick. Uh, he didn't show any symptoms, any fever, any cough. Because if he had those symptoms, the rules that I understand, he wouldn't have even been allowed onto the plane to come back. And B, he had a visa. He had a legitimate working visa that gave him status. And so the customs officer said the most life-giving words to me, welcome home. Welcome home. Can you imagine being in my friend's shoes? What would you feel like to be forbidden to come back to your home? And what joy and elation you would feel to hear those life-giving words, welcome home. Would you want to be forced not just outside of the city, but outside of the country? And yet, what Jesus has done is that he has come to this earth. He's left his country. He's passed through the heavens, come to us to take on the spiritual virus into his own body as he hung on the cross taking on all our sins, all our sicknesses, all our diseases. And what Jesus does is that he walks with us. In his death and resurrection, he walks with us to the customs gate of heaven. And he puts down authoritatively the one ultimate working visa, the visa of his perfect work. And if it is stamped on your heart and mine, his, the visa of his perfect work on the cross and redemption is stamped on our hearts, then we are welcomed home into God's country. So let me bring it full circle. What is the purpose of COVID-19? Whenever we face, we are face to face with disease and sickness, it's meant to be a stark reminder that this world and our lives, no matter how bright they might be at certain points, it's still cursed by sin. Whenever we face disease and sickness of any kind, our longing and our affections are meant to pine for Jesus, this final kingdom of the Lord. So let me leave you in the meantime until Christ returns again, this acronym, and I hope it helps you remember how we can practically live by faith as we live faithfully here on earth, even as we hope for Jesus Christ to return and finalize this new world, this new creation. And the acronym spells HEAL, H-E-A-L. H stands for Hope for the Healing of the Nations. E stands for Embrace Christ's Plan to Secure Your Faith. Meaning, if you're facing pain and suffering in your lives, just trust that God is, as a loving Father, allowing it. Because what God wants the most is for you not to lose faith, not to become so self-sufficient to forget Him. You'd rather have you suffer a little bit during this lifetime on earth so that you can spend eternity living the good life he always meant for you. A stands for adore Christ's distancing on the cross so you might come home. We all understand the, 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 the gravity and the seriousness of social and physical distancing and how hard it is. Just think of the leper. But now... You and I, as we adore Christ, that he is ultimately distanced for our sake, so that we can come home. Let's continue to adore Christ for that. And L, lead others to hope in Christ. Lead others, point others to this hope in Christ, especially during this time. And so I hope you'll be able to pray with me. Lord, I look forward to your healing.